the difficult questions of medical ethics, tonight, On Call. Funding for On Call Television is provided in part by... Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support on-call television as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding is provided by Dakota Care, the Brookings Health System, Dr. Mark Bubach with Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Dakota Dermatology, Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy, the Orthopedic Institute, and Swiftel Communications. Closed captioning for On Call is provided by the generous support of Avera, the Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation. How much information do you share with a patient? Should you accept that trip from the pharmaceutical company? What point do you remove life support? Difficult questions when the doctors are on call tonight. It's your decision. Hello and welcome to On Call Television. Isaac Asimov once said, the saddest aspect of life right now is that science gathers knowledge faster than society gathers wisdom. Indeed, the ethics of caring for dying people with compassion is wrestling with all our advancements in science. Tonight, we'll be exploring medical ethics, looking at the rules and standards that govern the conduct of a professional person practicing medicine. From the beginning, humanity has searched for principles of right conduct, the moral base that guides one to know right from wrong. The word professional comes from professing or promising with an oath in town square not to to betray the trust of the people. The oath of Hippocrates dating 500 years BC gave us our first standards of medical practice and historians say the most important promise was not to use our special knowledge to poison people. Since then, there have been many changes. Now we have cardinal virtues, such as do no harm without doing, do no good, do good without doing harm, base what you do on truth and science, respect your patient's right to self-direction, and when resources are limited, give to those who need them the most. These virtues guide us to value individuals and yet to try to bring the most good for the most people. But sometimes allowing the patient's choice and self-direction injures that person or others. Providing the whole truth causes harm and sustaining life causes suffering. These are ethical dilemmas and are the grist for tonight's mill. How do we answer tough medical ethical questions? Well, here to advise us are ethics experts, Drs. Michael Holland, a family physician from Pierre, and Michael Heisler, an intensivist from Sioux Falls. Mike, uh, let's, talk, let's start with you. You're a family physician yes. from Pierre, yes. and, what, and you're, the, uh, you're involved with the uh, uh, hospice committee there? Sure. We've, we've, uh have a hospice committee, we have a hospice service, we do palliative care, we have comfort care rooms at our facility that we use for people that are at the end of their life and and, uh, we've made that decision to pursue comfort care. And and how long have you been interested in this particular area? (coughs) It probably started when I was in training in uh, the mid-1990s, so my whole career. Yeah, this is of interest and Mm -hmm. a highlight uh, that's You've, you've, you've had in your life regarding this? You know, I, I don't know if I can pick one highlight, Rick, but it's, it's really the concept that everybody dies and, and we have to deal with this issue. And, and so um, I think we don't deal with it well as physicians, as a healthcare system, and I think we can always do better. So it's always a, an area of interest for me. 
So, Dr. Heisler, we have two Michaels, so I might just call you by your last name. Uh, what is your, I called you an intensivist. Is that the correct term for your specialty? It is. So, people like me do their regular residency and then they do an additional fellowship in critical care. And we end up as intensivists and we work in the ICU. And how did I get interested in this? There's no one who works in the intensive care unit who can avoid being interested in this, these kind of issues because we deal with them every day. <coughs> and I mean, you and I were uh, doing a cardiac, full cardiac arrest uh, the other night together as you were running the EICU and I'm there in the room uh, doing our best to, to bring somebody back to life and of course uh, that was, I want you to know how much I appreciated you being there, uh, number one, but that uh, I, then I had to turn around and, and uh, bring the bad news to the family, which was, you know, very hard, but at the same time a very meaningful part of my job. I think it's one of the most important parts that I do, you know, is helping people through this time. When it sure, and, and remember, you know, our history as physicians really began as priests. You know, we only became scientists in the early 19th you know, 20th century with the Flexner reports. Our tradition is one of healing and one of spirituality. So for me, the ICU, I, I say this to the house staff, the ICU is the one place in the hospital where there's an immediate interface between best science and best faith, best spiritual practice, if, if you're willing to, to live in both those worlds. Wow. Yeah, I, you know, I, I remember watching an old movie where uh, a boy was dying in the teepee and they called the healing man in, and the healing person uh, examined the, the, the boy and then made songs and danced and prayed, and the boy died. <coughs> and then I'm, I remember thinking, well, but that was useless. I mean, he's just a, sh it's a sham. And it was something that helped them greatly. And uh, I mean, what we do is not a sham, but, and we also, need to turn around and to give the, the support of the family, like that Indian healing person did in, in that show. Before we get started, I want to invite our audience partners to call in with questions about medical ethics at 1-888-376-6225, or submit your questions at oncalltelevision.com and click on the email question button. We need your calls. This is a very important issue. This uh, is... Uh, a time for you to call. Um, so, uh, you know, what we're going to do is we're going to jump right into um, one of the major um, uh, 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 tools that we have developed to aid our conversation this evening. We prepared some ethical vignettes for us to watch and then discuss. These situations are common in everyday medical practice. Here's the first vignette. Thank you so much for seeing us, Doctor. Uh, it's about my father, Todd Bateman. Oh, yes, I know him well. I've treated him for years. He's getting older. I'm, he's old. He's straight up old now. Well, he's 89. And no matter what I say, he won't give up his ratty old car. We're concerned that it might be dangerous. That he's going to kill someone, himself or one of his friends. He drives all his friends around because they're all too old to drive. Well, I've, I've spoken with him about it, and he says that he drives slowly and carefully and that he feels safe. But that... I mean, he shouldn't be the one to judge that, should he? His vision is bad. Yes. His gait is a bit compromised, but I've tested his eyesight, and it's well within the legal limits of being safe enough to drive. But, Doctor, there's got to be uh, something... Listen, the heart of the problem is his mental health, and... I do believe that he is competent enough to make legal decisions. How close is he to incompetence? Well, he passed. He just passed. Well, that is not good enough for us, doctor. Look, we would like for your doctor's orders to support us here, okay? He's too old to keep that old car. We need your help, doctor. Boy, that's a real scenario. I've been in it too many times. Yeah, I, I have too, yeah. I, as a family doc, this is the kind of thing we see with uh, families coming in. We take care of the whole family, and that's a very common problem. Well, and there's a lot of, yeah, and a lot of the questions is when, 
And what's more, I think he needs to be in, a, in an assisted living, and, uh, but he doesn't want to go there. Right. <clears throat> um, so the question has to do with competence. Uh, Mike, do you? Do but, you, you but you know, there's actually a bigger issue here. And, and I don't deal with this because I'm in the ICU, but I deal with it in my own family. And, and the real, for me, the real issue here is that people come to, to us, nurses, physicians, nurse practitioners, and they want black and white answers, whether it's about taking the keys away or, you know, should we continue, you know, uh, ventilators in the ICU, whatever. And if there's any rule that, that, that I've learned over time that we can leave with tonight when we finish this, is there is no black and white in the complexity of medicine. We live in an area that's gray all the time. And every situation is different, and I'm sure that's what you find in your practice. You just don't have a rule book that applies to everybody. You've got to sit down and listen. Absolutely, and, the, and the, <coughs> the idea that there's competence and incompetence or the pass, like they alluded to, you know, it's not that easy. I mean, it's really difficult sometimes. The other thing I get, I, I practice in a, in a rural area, a rural area, and, well, they only drive in town, you know, the small town. We don't let them drive in Sioux Falls or out of town. Or, or the patient says, I only drive where I know where I'm going, and it's safe. And so there, that's a real gray area, I think. If oh. But legally, I don't, I don't think a physician has the legal responsibility or even the professional responsibility to make that decision. I think we can just help people make that decision, but it's really one made by the family. <coughs> yeah, I, I don't yeah. think that the, the decision <coughs> about driving is something I can, I can do. What I can say is, he or she is competent or not. Now, I'm not very good at that. I mean, even with my best tools, they may be perfectly competent in the morning, and at about four in the afternoon, they're not competent anymore. You know? So they're not competent, meaning really have the judgment to make rational decisions. I mean, people talk about the mini mental status exam, above 20 is competent, below. I mean, that's a cutoff. That's an arbitrary cutoff. And my, my take home is this, and I want your response. I believe that when it's gray, I value not only doing good and always being honest, but I value the autonomy of the patient, the, 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 the choice of a patient. And there is, and it's the patient, not their kids, it's the patient's choice that I'm valuing. And so when it's gray, I say, if you're worried that you could be harmful, don't drive. But uh, let, them, let them go. I let them choose. I, I respect the person's uh, freedom as much as you possibly But what do you do if they say, I want to drive, and you know they're not competent? I mean, you deal with that all the time. What well, do you do with that? Yeah, and I think part of it is just you got to visit with that patient. And most of the time, if you spend the time and listen and find out what, what's going on, you can talk through, you know, they don't want to lose that independence. They don't want to rely on other family members to help them. And they understand. A lot of times people know they're not safe to drive. They, are, they may or may not be competent to make the decision. I find it almost less often a competency issue. It's mm -hmm. more of a safety issue, and, yeah. and that is a difficult thing. Although the safety issue is, I'm reassured by the science that says that the older people have a lot more uh, bangs and dings, but if you want to take, uh, be safe, you'd be sa better off taking all 18-year-old males off the road. <laughs> <laughs> the, risk, the risk takers. The risk takers than you would by taking these people off the road. So I think we need to respect people's freedom to choose as well as we can, as long as we can. And when that time comes that they, they, uh, they lose it, then they lose it. Well, let's, let's, let's uh, and by the way, join our conversation and call in your questions about uh, tonight's topic or your comments at 1-888-376-6225 or go to the email and uh, questions at oncalltelevision.com. So the next vignette, let's take the next vignette, please. Let me explain again. Because of complications with your Crohn's disease, you're bleeding internally. I understand. You're very high risk. You're losing blood now. It's not sustainable. We do have treatments available that work. I need to give you a blood transfusion. I will not ingest blood, doctor. Now, there's a very big difference between accepting blood into your veins, into your bloodstream, and ingesting blood either by eating or drinking it. I am a witness, doctor. 
Do you know what that means? I, I do. Jehovah's Witnesses are taught to refuse blood transfusions. That's right. In Genesis chapter 9 it says, But the flesh thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. That's part of our eternal covenant with God. It was agreed upon after the flooding of the world. Yes, but we're not going to make you drink the blood. We're trying... The doc doctor, the, the watchtower is very clear on the matter. I'm here for bloodless treatments. We know there have been great advancement in this in recent years. It's true, there has been, but in this case, I must strongly, how can I say this? I must insist that this is the course of action, the only course of action. Without it, you may die. Now, I want to respect your faith, Mr. Dilson, but I do hope you can think independently on this matter. The watchtower is very clear. Satan said to Eve that you can decide what is good or bad. You don't have to listen to God. He is not telling the truth. Satan's rebellion argues beautifully for independent thinking, Doctor. But I've devoted my life to God's will. And if his will is for me to die from this, so be it. We're trying to preserve your life. I know your intentions are good, Doctor. But I won't preserve my life at the expense of my eternal life. Listen, I know you are under great pressure from your community to maintain this belief. But you and I have a doctor-patient confidentiality. If you were to accept this procedure, which will save you from bleeding to death, mm. it will be a secret. No one will know. God will know. I, I have also had th that scenario uh, w several times in my practice. Have you, Mike? You know, I, I remember a couple instances in training. I have not had that happen in, in my practice in peer, fortunately. Yeah, the scenario was that uh, uh, in each case, the two cases, doctor, will you take care of me, uh, knowing that I won't take blood, and will you promise me that you won't give me blood? And my answer to them was, I promise. Mm -hmm. After that conversation that we had, she had earlier. Uh, what is your take on that? So this happens not uncommon in the ICU. Mm -hmm. um, and, and honestly, for me, this one's easy. I think there's no time when you don't respect a person's independent moral cho choices when they're competent. And that, that's not the hard one, and that's not the one that's been in the courts either, by the way. What? Where this gets complex is when a mother and father say they don't want a treatment for their child. Yeah. And that's mm -hmm. when it ends up in the courts, and that's when it ends up on TV, and that's when it's really, really tough. Yeah. Th this is another sidebar, just very quickly. We had a case not, not long ago where there was a Jehovah Witness in the ICU who was quite clear about not wanting to have blood, and then at literally about 2 in the morning ended up getting albumin. And the person who ordered the albumin didn't realize that albumin is a blood product. So the person got So the person got albumin, and then the question was, do you we tell them? them? Mm -hmm. And the answer is, of course you tell them. Because mm -hmm. the data, you want to talk about an ethical issue, this is really clear as well. The data is so clear about this. And, and maybe they do it different in Europe, and you and I have talked about this a little bit. But in the United States, and I think primarily based on lessons learned through the VA system, where their policy is you always immediately sit down with the family. And interestingly enough, as you both know, when that happens, the, the number of suits against physicians drop dramatically. Yeah, you, you, Families understand that we're human, yeah. you know? Yeah, I think they what do. they don't want is for us to <clears throat> pretend that we're not. Right. So, and then the case about, this is, I don't deal with children, you do. So that, that's the tough one. What do you do when the mom and dad say, I don't want that treatment yeah. for my child? Okay, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna <clears throat> bring it back to the, the three principles that I walk with. I mean, there's the one of justice, which is distributive, you know, who, you know, wh where does the money go? And that's what Obama's trying to deal with, or others in, in Washington. But uh, I deal with do good, you know, and don't do harm. I put that in, in one. Always to tell the truth, as you just said, I mean, truth-telling, plus I put in that truth part, 
the science is a search for truth, that you always believe, you look at the data as well as it can be. True data. And the third one is to respect a person's autonomy, their freedom to choose. And so we can see scenarios that fight where autonomy takes precedence over beneficence, doing good. And this is one. And your answer is autonomy does take over. Does it always? Well, so that gets tricky because what do you do with the patient in the ICU who wants everything done? And yet everything done means more time, more invasive harm, procedures, more harm, suffering, more suffering, and money. more whatever. Uh, true enough. Forget let's money. put the money off to the side for a minute. And that happens a lot in the ICU. And, yeah. and how do you handle that? And how do you help work so, your way through that? Sometimes what I try to talk to <clears throat> patients about is if, if they ask, if they're in for a broken leg and they say, could you take my appendix out while I'm here? You don't do that, right? Okay. <laughs> it's not indicated. Yeah. It's, not, it's not part of what you would do. And, and I know that's a stretch and that's the extreme, but there are times when people think they want something and it's not really the right thing to do. It's not even an indicated thing. I, I have a cold it. doctor. I want an antibiotic. Right. And the answer is, no, you don't. I'm not going to give you an antibiotic. No, I want that darn antibiotic. And so how much how am I respecting their autonomy? How, how about multi-system organ failure, um, sepsis, and so forth, and, and they want CPR and all the things that, you know, doesn't is not going to make a difference. It doesn't have so, a so this gets into a really important issue with, with us, not just as scientists, but us as partners, healers, clinicians. Humans. Humans, teachers. And I can tell you that in, I've been doing this a long time. God, I can't believe I've been doing this a long time, but I've been doing this a long time. And you know, one thing I'm, I'm really aware of is most times if you take time to sit down and listen to people and, the fam and families and help them walk their way through this, you can come to some common ground. The other thing that we need to talk about a little bit here tonight is, is how often families and patients don't really have the information they need to make, to make good decisions. And we think they all do. Right. Even advanced directives, which I know we're going to talk about in a little bit, the number of folks who don't really have advanced directives and understand what that is, is, is a whole nother issue okay. about this. I, so. I, maybe, it, well, I, it, it's just that, and, and I will highlight what you just said. I think you're absolutely on the, uh, the mark, and it's what you've said too, Mike. The value of sitting down and listening to them, and really listening, the family, the patient, to see what their needs are, is very important. But that, you know, I, I think the answer is, does beneficence or doing good overwhelm autonomy or respecting choice or overwhelm veracity or saying the truth and science-based uh, medicine? And the answer is, it's a balance. In every individual scenario, it's a balance. But your fundamental principles are right, and I never can think of a time where science overrules autonomy and respect for a person's own individual choice. Except for the antibiotics. Then you need to be an educator. <laughs> <laughs> then you need to do your job and teach. Yeah. No, yeah. but I, so. I, so autonomy is a huge thing, and I think we've made that point with these first two things. I wanted to say one comment. Uh, uh, we had a suggestion from the, from the audience that said that if you're driving and you're borderline, drive between 10 and 2 because the kids are in school during that time you, and uh, it's safer. I thought that was a good idea. good idea. Thank you for that. All right, so let's, let's take the next um, vignette, please. Uh, now the tests have, have just come back for my next patient, uh, Mr. Uh, Jared Sprock. Oh, is that the man with the cancer? Right. The results are not good. Uh, his pancreatic cancer has spread to his liver and his brain, and we're at the point that treatment options are really pretty futile and would cause about as much suffering as they'd be trying to relieve. So I think we're going to have to start thinking about how to transfer him to hospice. Oh, I'm sorry about that, doctor. Are you the one who's going to have to tell him the news? Yeah. So, what's the latest, doctor? Uh, well, we... We're still waiting to hear some of the test results. Uh, we may have some setbacks, but I don't want to worry you. Uh, we're doing everything we can here. So, we don't know anything new? Well, uh, 
We do have reason to believe that the cancer has not responded to the chemo as we'd hoped, uh, but it's nothing conclusive. Okay, so uh, just keep your spirits up, keep the fight alive. That's really the only way to beat this thing, okay? Okay. Uh, so I'll be back tomorrow and we'll talk about where we are and, and where we go from here. And maybe I'll have some more conclusive test results soon. Okay? Okay. Uh, okay. Um, well, I need to move on, but I will see you very soon, Mr. Sprock. Okay, doctor. I'll see you soon. Thank you. Oh, Kelly? Could I ask you something? Um, sure. Do you know more about my cancer than I do? Because the doctor says there's reason to believe that the cancer isn't gone. What does that mean? Are the tests back or aren't they? Oh, um... Well... Join our conversation and call in your questions or comments about tonight's topic at 1-888-376-6225 or email them to questions at oncalltelevision.com. So there's the issue of truth-telling. Uh, tell me that you haven't been the doctor squirming and wrestling with uh, how to tell people uh, the story. It's difficult, but you can't. I, I don't think you can. I don't agree with not, what do you do? Yeah, I think you just have to, people want answers, and to not tell the story, not to tell it straight is really not not acceptable. That's, that, that one, not at all acceptable. I know it's, it's, it's been done. I think the paternalistic aspect of, you know, we'll do what's best for you, you don't ask any questions, we'll just trust us, is, I, I think there's some of that, but I, I think that, uh, Right now, the best thing to do is be honest with people. But you don't want to take their hope. <clears throat> yeah, you have to do it in the right way, I think, and, and, or in a way that I think is realistic. You have to tell them what you know and tell them what that means. And sometimes that means what Mike was saying. You've got to listen to them, and you've got to take a little more time, and that's difficult sometimes. Right. So you have your three principles. Here's a fourth. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And I, and I really try to think that through. What, how would I want someone to treat me? And, and I can tell you really, and, and this, this is going to sound like a grandiose statement, but it's really true. I have never, N-E-V-E-R, never been in a situation where I sat down with a patient or a family and said, let's really talk through where we are where they didn't want to know exactly what they were up against. Exactly. Right. And in fact, not uncommonly, the patient already knows they have cancer. Yeah. And they don't want to talk about it because they're afraid they're going to upset their family. Well, and right. and, you know, that, 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 and, and they're it. so relieved when you finally say, OK, here's where we really are. Let's just be as clear as we can about it. Now let's talk about what's in front of us. Yeah. But I've never, ever had a situation where a family has said anything other than, great, you're treating me like I'm an adult. I've had families um, ask me, so what, doctor, before you tell him, what, what did you find? And instead of what they do in Europe, they, they go to the family and they say, should we, should we tell them that they have cancer? And the family says, no, just tell us, that's it. We'll, we'll just protect him from the sadness. In fact, Emperor Hirohito of Japan died of cancer, not knowing he had cancer, because they protected him from the truth. But it's the other way around. Now what I do is I go to the patient first and say, can I tell your family? And oh, yeah, I, think I think that's, that's true. Yeah. That's autonomy again, you that's know, and respecting a person's you know, dignity. Yeah. Unless they can't speak for themselves. Unless they're in my place where they're on tubes and drips and yeah. <laughs> I can't talk to them. No. And then I've got to talk to family. Yeah. But you know, this is really interesting. I, I say this to families. When I was younger, when I was out of residency and even new in practice, families would say to me, what do you think? And I would never answer the question because in med school I was taught, don't be that directive. You know, provide information and let the family make the decision. And you know what I've learned? I don't know what you guys have learned, but
but I have learned families want you to tell them what you think. Yeah. Respectfully and not in a, right. in a dogmatic way. And so now what I end up saying to families is, <clears throat> okay, I really want to listen to what you all think, and then if you'd like me to, if it would be useful to you, I'm glad to tell you what I think, but I want to answer it two ways. I want to answer it based on the best science, and then I also want to tell you what I would do if it was my dad. And every time families have said, that's exactly what we need. Right. right. I have, I have <clears throat> always said that if it was my wife, my dad, my parent, my child, uh, this is what I would do. And I've been advised through the years, or back in the old days, not to do that. <laughs> I, I was the same way. And I, and I think you have to talk to the family first, talk to the patient. Um, you can sense when they want to know what you really think. or And then that's when I usually bring that up after we've talked about things. And if, if people have, I mean, if they don't sense, if they don't give me the impression that they want that, they, they know what they want, they're not interested in what I would do, you can sense that pretty quickly. Yeah. But there are a lot of instances where they're just, you can sense they're just, they don't know what to do. And what would you do, Doc, or what do you recommend? And, and we get that every day. Truth telling is, is so very important. I think it's a, if you talk about ethical issues, I think it's a fundamental part of ethics that we respect, treat with dignity, honor autonomy, and tell the truth. I mean, that, that's it. Those that are the really principles. is it. Which so. I think, you, or you can summarize it, do unto others as you would have done, do unto you. Or as the Asians say, don't do unto others what you wouldn't want done to you. <laughs> okay, so here are the three of us sit here having this grand conversation about all of this. And in reality, you know what happens. What happens in the real world in hospitals all over this country is that we don't do a very good job with all of this. And, and, you know, we don't get into lots of discussions about academic papers, but you all know the support study in 1995, yeah. which was a landmark study that looked at, you know, 4,000 patients with 9,000 interventions where the fundamental issue was how do we as medical professions, we know we, we think we do a good job with this, but how do we really do? And, and it was done at four academic centers, and you guys both know the results of that study. Yeah. We did terribly <coughs> with pain management and with discussions about end of life and, and DNR respecting the, and, and respecting. The, the, we did terribly. Yeah. And so now that's, that's 1995, so here we are five, almost 20, whatever, you know, years later, and they're going back and saying, are we doing better? Well, we are doing better, but we're still not doing great with mentoring students and residents about this, yeah. and we need to do a better job I, I, with teaching that. Teaching our, our residents, yeah. I think that's it. I, I do, I, and the, the support study showed that their intervention plan, after they showed how bad they did, they went in with a nurse practitioner or a PA or a nurse educator, they went in, they harangued everybody to try to educate the patient, try to do better at pain relief, try, try to let go when somebody's certainly dying, and they, they restudied and found no difference. They couldn't change it. And when you ask families about their experience in hospitals, they come away bewildered and confused and unhappy and unsettled yep. and lost. But they don't tell us that. No. They tell everybody else that, yeah. but not us. <laughs> no. And I'm sure the people listening tonight know exactly what yeah. we're talking about. Uh, so. but except yeah. maybe in peer. No. No, it's the same. It's the same. No, we. You know, the other thing that they showed was, you know, doctors quit seeing their patients when they're dying, right? When you transition them to that comfort and care only and that palliative care, a lot of times the, people the don't want to you touch know, the them. teams of doctors that would come around and see them. Uh everybody disappears and they and so that's that's the other thing that we don't do a good job well of. and you know what uh, family or or friends kind of have a hard time talking mm -hmm. to people who have a, a cancer because it makes them f feel vulnerable and then suddenly they have nobody visiting them anymore mm -hmm. and so I I would say uh, that this is a shout out to everybody out there to visit the people who are dying uh, like you would if they were getting better and you wanted to give them, even if they can't talk to you. I think they know you're there. Uh, we have a question from New York, New York. Uh, I wonder who that could be. Uh, actually, I have to shout out to my son and his actor friends who did our vignettes and how wonderful it was uh, that they did it. This one said, what would you do if the pa parents were insisting for a foster child? Uh, that's it. Insisting uh, if their foster child, Jehovah Witness, needed blood. 
That's, see, now we're into the gray of grays. Boy, that's, that's a gray one, isn't that's it? That's a tough one. And if they, if, if the person, first of all, thanks for the question. It's yes. a great question. Because you know what that does? That defines the world that we all live in every day. You know, I, I don't know about your practice. Yeah. <laughs> it's you know, impossible honestly, answers. You know, people think that physicians, you know, we, we have all the answers, we have all this training, you know, we know exactly what to do every time. And, and the truth of the matter is that, okay, the science side, we know pretty much how to bring the science to bear. But at least half of medicine has nothing to do with science. No, more than half. Yeah, it has as, to. As, as yeah. Uh, Isaac Asimov said, Science is here, and we're we're trying to catch up in this ethical issue. So what, have, so what do you so we have, that Well, we have ethics <laughs> committees we can utilize, and what do they do? They look at all these issues, and and they make, you know, some uh, recommendations, or they make uh, they make comments. I should say they don't even really make recommendations a lot of the time. But these are these are really fortunately difficult, unfortunately difficult situations. But you know. Hope, hopefully not too so, common. Did, uh, but we, we didn't answer the question, would you force the, the child? Let's say that this child, let's ch switch it. This is a child, a, a real case, who uh, developed leukemia. A childhood <coughs> acute lymphocytic leukemia, very treatable. This is like 20 years ago, actually. And the parents decided that they want to give the child apricot pit uh, therapy in Mexico and we're going to take the kid down there, and somebody blew the whistle and said, you can't do that. This kid is going to die if you choose so poorly. What should we as a society do in that case? And so you know the answer is that every state has its own laws about this, and these end up in the courts. They, these end up with, you know, 12 o'clock meetings before the, you know, the magistrate where the medical team and the family or whoever not uncommonly are in court. Yeah. And, and this is one time when the medical world and the legal world and the ethical world and the ministerial world get together and try to figure out a way through this. And it, and it yeah. doesn't really matter what, <clears throat> what we think because there's always somebody that's going to disagree with us. Another physician colleague, a nurse, social worker. I mean, that's where that's why they become court right. issues. Uh, and, and I'll give you the straight answer on the apricot issue. I agreed with the court's decision. They took the child away from the parents and gave the child the treatment, cured the child, gave the child back to the parents. That's where autonomy didn't overtake uh, uh, beneficence. Beneficence took over. And in this Jehovah's Witness case, I don't know the answer. The child hadn't developed his opinion. I, I would say it's the same, and, uh, in my own opinion. But as you say, you can, you can uh, irritate somebody on every case. And in this world of ethics, this is, this is, this is, uh, this is what it's like. Okay, a question, uh, what role does faith and hope play in the healing process? So how important is hope? If you tell the person they've got a terminal cancer, there's nothing you can do, you've got 100% death in three months, what, where is your role of hope and how can you handle that? Mike. Well, I think the important thing is to, the worst thing you can say is there's nothing we can do because there's always something that can be done to help them through this process, right? Right. Everybody's going to die. And, and when we have terrible news like that, we have to talk about how we're going to get through that process and what we can do for them and how we can help them through that, how we can help them to stay comfortable, to treat their pain. And, um, I mean, that's a long process, and yeah. it takes a lot of listening, but that's what we need to do. Well, and I think lots of love and, and the minister's help. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, there's a book called Final Gifts by two hospice nurses that talk about never taking away all their hope. There's always a chance to. Yeah, but so, so this is a great way to, to segue into this is where hospice and early home hospice yeah. and palliative care which is not meant to be the last two days of a person's life, yeah, but really an, a, a, an early process where I can, I'll say to someone, you know, I never say never. I don't make the big decisions here. Yeah. I actually say that to people. I realize my role in this hierarchy here. Right. So the, the big decisions are made somewhere else. That said, the best advice I can give you is it's not likely you're going to recover. But that doesn't mean we can't help you. And that's it. And we're going to get hospice involved here. And hospice does such oh my a God, great they, job. They are so wonderful. Yeah, in so many ways. So I, I never say never, but I always say we can help. Great. And here's and how. And with so. that, we'll go to our next vignette. 
This just doesn't make any sense. I just can't get behind the idea of refusing to... of starving my own father. Dan, it's not like that. We don't know how long this coma will last, so that means it might not be for so very long. It might be a relatively short one, right? Right. Dad said he didn't want to be hooked up with tubes. I mean, I know. I mean, I believe you. It's just, I wasn't there. And now we're here and he's in trouble. And I can't believe that you think we should cut off his care. I mean, look, this is not an easy decision for families to make. Okay, it's really frustrating. It's hard. Okay, but what I can tell you all is that there are new studies out that say if a patient is so far gone that they can't eat or drink and they have to be kept unnaturally fed and hydrated, you know, it's causing more suffering and that letting nature run its course is maybe best and to support it and keep the patient comfortable, you know, but and offer pain medication. Dad will die if we don't feed him, right? I mean, he'll starve to death without the, without the feeding tube, right? But the thing is that staying alive, I mean, being kept alive by a machine, that's oftentimes a worst case scenario for most people. And that's what dad thought and felt. How sure are you, Noah? Uh, because you seem so certain that we should cut off his support. Oh, well, I mean, he put it in writing. It's his official statement. Um, uh, advanced directive, right, doctor? That's right. Yeah, an advanced medical directive is a kind of decision in advance for a situation like this where we can't communicate with your dad anymore. Is this like a, a living will? Yeah, a living will is a kind of advanced directive. The words living will. I mean, it's this painful contradiction. Is he living or is he dead? Well, that's what he wanted to avoid. That's why he made an advanced directive. I mean, in it he says, uh, here, let me see. I would prefer to refuse aggressive medical intervention rather than to have my life medically prolonged. I sometimes find it helps if you imagine him saying it. I mean, these are your dad's words. It's hard because I also know he gave Noah the power of attorney, so if he's already made up his mind, then... I'm yeah. not trying to decide anything. I'm just trying to honor Dad's wishes. But it stings to feel powerless in this whole thing. Yeah, it does. That's why I wanted to talk to you two about it and to have the doctor here and to, you know, get your support on this, on, on Dad's wishes. I mean, he didn't want to end up like this, hooked up to tubes. I know. Me too. So you understand me? I, I, you're behind me on this? Doctor, what would you do if we couldn't find consensus? Well, <clears throat> I've been in that scenario a whole bunch. Mike? Well, we talked about that on the way here tonight. You know, you, you, sometimes you think you have consensus, you have the advanced directive. We've taken care of people for years. We know them well. We know their their desires. And uh, a family member, whether it be a, a child or a niece or a nephew or, or whatever, comes from far, far away. away and, and uh, yeah, maybe has not been involved as much as they would have liked. Feeling and, guilt. Yep, feeling guilty. And, and so that does become a dilemma. But uh, personally, I think that's why we have advanced directives. And I think they did a good job of explaining why this isn't us making this decision. This is your father made this decision in anticipation that someday he may not be able to tell us what he wants. And so. Had he not done that living will, what do you think would have, uh, how convincing would that one son be? That would be more difficult. You know, the toughest situation I find myself in is when there's not an advanced directive in the ICU. Because I don't know folks. You know, right. you, you know folks. You've known them for 20 years. And, and I think that where we err is on too much care. If we make a mistake, it's on too much care, not on limiting care. Everybody thinks the real issue in the ICU is that we limit care. That's not true. The real problem in the ICU is that we do way, 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 way too much you beyond just, what you makes sense. You just have carte blanche, keep going until they're dead. Just keep yeah. going. And uh, 
I think we don't talk to the family enough, too. Exactly. Well, I, I had a real case of a man who had a stroke, and about six months later, after multiple intubations, <clears throat> recurrent pneumonia, uh, healed, tubes out, recurrent pneumonia because he can't protect his airway. He was aspirated, <coughs> right? So then he would uh, get another uh, pneumonia, then he would be intubated with a breathing tube and then he would be sick in, in the, and so he had been in the hospital about as much as he was out and he was very very compromised by the stroke and but he could say a few words talk to the family and each time the scenario is is this what dad would want and half the family was saying you got to stop doing this there's a time to let go and the other fa fa family members were fighting for his life and they were at just at pitchforks at each other. And so, you know, one of the things that came out of the support study was a commitment to and major funding to support palliative care programs, which have grown, in, you know, asymptotically Huge. all over the country. And so for folks who are listening to us tonight, if there's, if there's one message that they get from us, and that is they need to know that these teams of people who are trained in these issues, who are focused on family, not on the patient, the patient, of course, but they're focused on the family, and it's not a physician, it's social worker and nurse and chaplain and, phys you know, it's a team of people. Like the hospice group. They're, in, they're in your hospital, they're in your hospital. Yes. You have palliative care services. Yeah. They're at ours in Avera, McKenna, and Sioux Falls. Yeah. And those are great, great resources for people to tap into to help them through these tough times. They didn't used to be there, and they're, they're now more and, and more And available. even in small community <coughs> hospitals, it may not be as, you know, formal as consulting the palliative care service, but you know, the doctor and the social workers and the chaplain, they work as a hospice or as a palliative care team. Right. So I think even in small communities so, where so, some people so say... Families aren't alone. I think right. that's a really major message here. There, there's a lot of folks who can help them through this if they just are told about yeah. it. So right. have an op option. Yeah. I would say <coughs> this. I think that in towns that are smaller, like Pierre and Brookings, where the primary care doctors not only caring for them as an outpatient, but taking care of them or following them in the hospital very carefully. Sometimes we do a bit better than the bigger hospitals where they're lost to the hospitals. And we had one, one question that said from uh, Rapid City, uh, I, you know, I, I would rather my primary care doctor uh, see their family physician and take care of me in the hospital than the hospitalist because they're not monitoring they they don't know this this palliative care option and i think that's really true i think we could do better better in the bigger hospitals than we do partly because that family physician connection in the hospital is lost absolutely and imagine how tough it is for me to hear that you're the intensivist i, I meet somebody at 11 o'clock at night and they're within 12 hours of dying and i'm meeting their wife for the first time right and i've got to sit down with her in the next 15 minutes well that's why i do critical care because you know i don't i don't shy away from that but you guys both have the great advantage of, of knowing folks for right. a long time. Well, and the family too. Here's a question, please address how to talk with families of someone who is said to be brain dead and the family is at different levels of acceptance. There it is, family issue again. Mike. Brain dead, and so the question is always, you know, first of all, are they brain dead or are they gonna recover, right? right. Uh, and I think as a family doc in a small community hospital, that can be so difficult and sometimes it's, important to get some specialty opinion on that, get a neurologist, get a critical care doc's opinion. And, and the fortunate thing with telemedicine and things like that, we can do that. Uh, just like you'd mentioned, uh, we can, I can have Mike help us out in the intensive care right. unit and peer as well. Right. So that we can do some of that stuff in our hometowns, which I think will help. But uh, getting some expert opinion is always important in these situations. So here's the ethical issue. And I agree totally with what you said. Don't draw lines in the sand. Don't ever get trapped into we, they. It's always us. Mm -hmm. And the okay. families are having a tough time with it. They're not having a tough time because they're trying to be difficult. They're having a tough time because someone they love is, is, is having in, a tough time and is in real trouble. Right. And our role as healers is to help them with right. that, not to get into we, they issues. That's it's just exactly silly. Right. That's what so. I, this man who, who was intubated again and who had this aspiration pneumonia, recurrent pneumonia, I spent mornings you know, and a half an hour with the families together, powwowing, talking about, you know, choices. And finally it came down, what happened was, 
the question was, what would he have wanted should he known this? What would he have wanted? Let's talk about, we went around the room, and of course, the one who was resistant of letting him go, well, he would have wanted to, he wouldn't have wanted this. Yeah, and we had a question earlier about what role does faith play in the work that we do? This is a perfect example where, you know, sometimes it takes time. You're not going to fix it by 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. No. And sometimes these knots get untied when I get the pastor or the minister, yeah. <laughs> or you know, someone, someone who's helped. connected to that world that can part. really help so much. So. We've, we've got about 30 <laughs> seconds. How can I prevent the health care system from res res resuscitating me with getting a tattoo help? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's down, that sounds funny, but we kid about that. You know, in the medical profession, we say, you know, get no CPR tattooed on our yeah. chest, you know. <laughs> Because we get confused. Someone comes from a nursing home and we don't know. What are we supposed to do? You need to make yeah. sure that you have an advanced director that your major Absolutely. hospital. Five seconds. Any Absolutely. other comment? Mike? Comfort <coughs> One is a good Comfort system. Comfort One is a good system. Yeah, a bracelet and, and have the documentation. Absolutely. Very good. We'll be back right after this. When you smoke, so does your baby. If you smoke while you're pregnant, you're putting deadly poisons into your blood the same blood you share with your baby. It can damage baby's lungs, cause premature birth, underweight babies. Plus, babies of moms who smoke are up to three times more likely to die of SIDS. Please quit before it's too late. The American Medical Association's Code of Medical Ethics says it plainly. Physicians are to sustain life but also to relieve suffering. And where one duty conflicts with the other, then the preference of the patient or his representative should prevail. Like the CEO of McKinnon Hospital recently said, the person or the person's representative should have the last say. That conflict plays out in a newspaper story of a young man who had severe brain injury some 14 years ago and is still in a persistent vegetative state. The despondent mother reportedly now wants to stop artificial hydration and let him die a natural death. This dilemma brings up several ethical questions. Would stopping fluid feedings be more merciful than keeping him alive for years in a vegetative state? The paradox of fluid replacement meant to sustain life is that it can also prolong pain and suffering. In this case, there is a significant burden of suffering from severe muscle spasms, not to mention the consequence of total bed rest and complete dependency. Would stopping fluid feedings cause him to suffer? Scientific experience tells us that during the dying process, if dehydration occurs, the brain produces natural endorphins that reduce pain and provide comfort. This allowed a human being will slip away gently over an 8 to 12 day period of time. Just like nature has done it for as long as humans have walked this earth. That is until we interrupted the natural process less than a century ago with artificial hydration. Is there a difference between not starting fluid feedings in the first place and stopping them at any time? The AMA Code of Medical Ethics and the Law of the Land both state that there is no ethical or legal difference between not starting treatment and stopping. Any treatment started to enhance a health and diminish suffering can be stopped, especially if the situation changes and treatment is no longer helping or is causing harm. Do I, as an individual or someone acting on my behalf, have the right to ask for the tube to be removed? Yes, especially where sustaining life might cause suffering. Further, the physician should either honor those wishes or if the physician believes this is not consistent with her or his personal ethics, then transfer the patient to the care of another doctor. Well, what is the most important lesson from this story? We should all talk to our family in advance about our wishes regarding vegetative states and feeding tubes. It might prevent a lot of suffering.
This brings us to the end of our show this evening. I sincerely thank our guests and good friends, Drs. Michael Holland and Michael Heisler for helping us to answer these important questions about ethics and medicine. As often happens, we aren't able to get all of our audience questions done, so we'll come back for them. Go to oncall.com and get your answers. American philosopher and psychologist William James once said, when you have to make a choice and don't make it, that in itself is a choice. So tonight or soon, talk to your family about the end of life choices. Until next time, stay healthy out there, people. Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call Television as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medical Care Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding is provided by Dakota Care, Brookings Health System, Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Dakota Dermatology, Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy, the Orthopedic Institute, and Siftel Communications. Closed captioning for on-call is provided by the generous support of Avera, the Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation. Mm -hmm.